To answer this question, I'm going to look exactly into what sustainable architecture actually is and whether it's actually possible to achieve or not. I'm going to look into the history of what sustainable architecture has been and compare it to the advancements we've made now and project what that is into the future. And I'm going to have my main focus around Foster and Partners. Let's start with sustainability. What does the word sustainable actually mean in terms of architecture and development? According to the Sustainable Development Commission, sustainable development is a development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So this means that it provides what we need right now as well as the future with whatever they may need, whether that adapts and changes. Having the ability to be prepared for the future makes sustainability a key thing in architecture and development an increasingly more important feature as the Earth's resources decline and scientists keep banging on about global warming and how us humans are damaging the planet with all of our energy usage. Is there actually such thing as sustainable and green architecture? Does it actually exist? So far, buildings that exist with this sustainable title can effectively power and run themselves as well as be green and have plantation to support the environment and ecosystem around them. But what about when they're actually building the buildings? Okay, so just take a look at this construction site right next to where I currently live. Surely all the machines being used here, this guy here, this guy here, and even like the cranes, surely that energy, the amount of energy used there can't be recovered no matter how green or sustainable the building may be in the future. Back to sustainability being a good thing, because I believe that is what needs to be done and we need to extend the Earth's resources for as long as we can, if not never run out because we achieve full sustainability. To make a building sustainable while in use, there are many factors that can be incorporated into the building to help it become more sustainable, including smart technologies. These come in a range of different products and items, from a spoon that stops somebody's hand from shaking because they're Parkinson's disease to an electric billboard that takes up the whole of a wall that can change according to what one person's walking by and their interests. But how would these things help save energy? This shows that technology can be programmed into doing specific tasks that we need it to perform, including reacting to the environment around it. So light sensors in street lights can tell the light to turn on when it gets dark and turn off when it gets light again. This obviously saves power during the day when the light's not needed. There have also been lights that are attached to motion sensors rather than light sensors so that when someone's walking through a room, the light will turn on as they come in and then it will turn off as they go out. I first came across this about six years ago when watching a video about Bill Gates' house where you'd have a sensor attached to you or in your pocket. Once inside, you'll wear a special pin that uniquely identifies you and connects you to the home's electronic services. The lights ahead of you gradually come on while those in the rooms you've left behind turn themselves off. Energy production and renewable energy, that is a very, very important part of this. For a building to run without using power that is supplied to it from an external source, like the national grid or the equivalent of the national grid, it has to have its own way of supplying power itself. This may include solar powers and solar cells. These capture light energy from the sun and turn it into electrical energy. There's also wind turbines, which of course turn the wind into kinetic energy of its spinning, which goes through the motors, which turns it into electrical energy. Wave energy, which is vaguely similar and tidal energy which is vaguely similar to that. Triple glazing. This one may sound a bit more basic, most of the windows now that are produced are double glazing. Having energy efficient windows is really important because they're like the holes in the building where heat can escape from in colder countries or where heat can come in to the buildings in hotter countries. Which way the building is facing? This makes a huge difference in lighting and in heating. So there are two areas that you can save power usage and money on. For example, Bedstead, Beddington, zero emission development, bedsed, which is just outside London. The orientation of the buildings means that all of the residential developments face south. 
and on the south facade there is a sun space so that provides a large heated area that then um, balances out the temperature of the, the building overall. And they're south facing because in the northern hemisphere the sun rises in the east, goes around the southern side of the sky and then sets in the west, meaning that the light and heat will be coming in for the majority of the day. Greenery and plantation. Buildings that incorporate plantation and gardens and that are usually found in cities as they can create the illusion of having an escape from the hectic man-made feel and aesthetic of a city. Also, this planting of plants can help the building's carbon balance be neutralised as when plants photosynthesize, they take in the carbon dioxide, which is the stuff that we produce as our waste product through most of our usage of fossil fuels, and then they breathe out oxygen, which is what we take in, which is also very handy. One Central Park is a 117 meter high residential tower that was redeveloped in 2013. It features what is known as vertical gardens, which is effectively a small amount of garden at the end of each floor that climbs up the face of a building. Finally, site transportation. Some developments are huge, like whole towns or campuses or even cities, which is what I'm looking at. These may require people to get from one side to the other with more speed than what walking can provide, or even running. So with that in mind, Studios Architecture brought in the bicycle to get around the Googleplex campus in California really easily and quickly and efficiently. They're the main sort of topics that I'm looking at for sustainability at the moment, so let's move on from there. So now here's where we change the topic a bit and go off sustainability for a tiny little bit of time and we move on to foster and partners. So what comes to mind when I say foster and partners? Is it London, like the Gherkin, or is it Australia with Regent Place, or maybe something else? So, bringing Foster and Partners and the sustainability bit together a bit here, what are Foster and Partners doing with sustainability? What's happening in that department of Foster and Partners? Well, according to their website, sustainability has been a central theme of Foster and Partners work for more than 40 years. This means that since 1976, going by the current year that it is when I'm saying this, which is 2016, since 1976, Foster and Partners have been putting some form of sustainability into their projects purposefully. The earliest development that fits into this time span is the Renault Distribution Centre in Swindon, in the UK which was developed in 1980 to 1982. However, there isn't really much evidence that there was any thought towards sustainability in this. There is only one sketch that may, that may indicate anything towards the previously discussed topics, which is that there's sunlight entering through a skylight. It shows this with the dotted lines that you can see here which would obviously help save electricity on power on lighting and it would save the power on heating. This wouldn't like have a majorly massive effect at all, it's not like it's enough to like save the world or anything, but at least it's a start. During 1982 to 1985, the BBC Radio Centre was designed and developed with maybe a little bit more attention to the point of letting natural light in, as this sketch clearly shows the angle of the roof being designed with skylights in to allow more light and also more heat in. That's where Foster and Partners started with it. I, th I feel that's where they started with it anyway. Moving on to the present, what they're currently doing. Mazda Institute has recently been developed from 2007 to 2015 as it's a major project in Abu Dhabi. It's designed to be a clean tech lab attracting universities and companies alike. But what has been done to make this project sustainable? Well, quite a lot actually. These are like the main headlines, if you will. The renewable energy. Since it's based in the hot, sunny, hot, did I say hot already? Atmosphere of Abu Dhabi, solar energy is the best source of renewable energy for this project as there is, there is a lot of sun and a lot of light around for a lot of the day. With this in mind, the majority of the rooftops in this institute are covered in photovoltaic panels, which help provide power to the city. They also shelter courtyards and outdoor spaces to stop 
them getting too hot and needing extra cooling, which also saves power. As well as those photovoltaic panels, there's more photovoltaic panels. There is a near sight 50 megawatt photovoltaic array of concentrated solar power plant. This obviously gives a major boost in producing the energy that this institute needs to run. Next thing, building materials. Concrete is often what's used in building things. It's not the most environmentally friendly material out there. So what they use in the Mazda Institute is low carbon concrete. This is what low carbon concrete is and they've used 100% certified timber. This is what 100% certified timber is. The direction in which the buildings are facing now, when I discussed this earlier, I said about bed Z and it was southern, the glass walls were southern facing to let more light and heat in. In Abu Dhabi, you don't need to let light and heat in because it's already very hot and very bright. Or you don't need to let as much heat in anyway, you want to cut down on that heat. This is done by having the main open window expanses facing courtyards in between the buildings with additional shelter from the sun provided by overhanging roofs made from photovoltaic panels. There are also structures and screens built over the windows that face towards the sun so that not all of the intensity of the sun's heat is let through into the buildings. So with just those three main pointers, you can probably already tell that the Mazda Institute was built for sustainability and to keep running for a long time. But the Mazda Institute is only a small part in what is a much larger, larger project. This larger project is known as the Mazda Development. Still in Abu Dhabi, still in the same place, just a much, much bigger area of it. See, the institute, that's around about 4,000 square metres, which is 0.4 hectares. The full mass star development is 640 hectares. So this makes this a large urban city, which is being built with sustainability in mind. What are Foster and partners doing with this city to make it as sustainable for the future as possible? When you think of a city, you might think of London, you might think of New York, you might think of Tokyo, you might think of Beijing. What do these things have in common? Gridlock, traffic jams. So what is being done in a sustainable city to stop the large traffic jams? The system is known as personal rapid transport. To explain why it's lifted and the transport is underground, I'll just hand you over to Gerard Evenden, who is a senior partner and design director at Foster & Partners. If vehicles are going to become more efficient and driverless, and they're going to follow networks and they're going to be programmable, then you have to separate them from the human because the human's unpredictable. And that's why the city's lifted. And that's going to be revolutionary for transportation. Also, by having a separate system and not having cars and buses, and you also don't get all that pollution. The whole of the development has the same solar voltaic panels on the roof as what the current institute has. All the buildings also have the sides cut in at angles so that the sun doesn't quite hit the windows and go in and all that heat go in, it just goes down the side of the building. As well as having the layout specifically designed so that the natural flow of air and the natural winds will go through the town, cooling it down. As well as the town being designed like that, each individual building is designed to have air specifically flow through courtyards and through open spaces so that it can cool down the insides without needing to power this cooling. So overall, I believe that Foster and Partners have done a very good job in stepping up the game in sustainability for the future and hopefully other companies and architects and whatever will follow on from this and be inspired by this to create a better future for us all.